Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about university collaborations and consortia. Kristen McGuire is Executive Director of the Baltimore College Town Network, which works to brand Baltimore as a city that attracts and retains college students. Kristen sits on the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance Board and was named a Successful by 40 VIP by Maryland's Daily Record. Bob Walton is CEO of the Claremont University Consortium, which has a $38 million budget to provide central coordinating for the Claremont Colleges in Southern California. Bob is the author of two books and is a board member of the Association for Consortium Leadership. Welcome to both of you. Great, thank, thank you. you. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, maybe if we could start by um, asking a, a basic question, which is what is a consortium, a university consortium? Well, first, well, thanks for having us on. Um, from my perspective, a consortium is something that's a little bit more formalized than a collaboration. So collaborations happen between higher education institutions all the time, but a collaboration is more formalized in that there are programs in place that have longevity, there's staffing that you know, is in place just to support that consortium, and funding that's dedicated to supporting the activities of a consortium. Well, I would agree with Kristen. I think that the uh, primary difference is collaboration happens in all universities of any size, but uh, consortium is where they formalize, and in some cases it can be an informal agreement or a memorandum of understanding, but in most cases it's a 501c3 where you actually have legal status, can hire employees, and, and accept money and, and do programs. And in the Claremont case, you actually have a fairly large staff, if I understand this correctly. We have a staff of 350, uh, which is large by consortium standards, and that's because the colleges that we serve, called the Claremont Colleges, we provide a lot of the basic services that those colleges use outside of the academic programs, which are, of course, the unique providence of those colleges. So if you would mind saying a word or two, what are some of the services that you do provide? The services really fall in three sort of baskets uh, of things. We have business services that we provide, so everything from running the payrolls or doing the accounting, risk management. Uh, we certainly help on facilities matters. We run the student services. So for example, we have an Office of Black Student Affairs. We run a medical program supporting the students who are in residence at the colleges. And then we also uh, you know, work in some academic areas. Primarily, we operate a central library system and operate a field station that uh, supports research by students and faculty. And Kristen, how do you do it? You, do you have a central office as well? We do have a central office. Our staff is significantly smaller with three people and lots of interns. Um, and we're a little different in that we're not supporting the core functions of a university, but we are supporting students in terms of bringing them to Baltimore and then getting them engaged in the region after they graduate. So we run marketing programs and articulating the benefits of being in college in Baltimore, the region. Um, and then once students get on campuses, we run a shuttle bus to get them around to different social destinations. We run service programs and lots of college activities, arts and culture things to get them out into the community, internships, other things like that. And how does the internship, how, do you arrange joint internships or do you, how does that work? Our primary function is actually to deliver internships to students. So I used to meet with a lot of businesses who said it was difficult for them to find out where to post internships. So if you're in higher ed, it can be confusing to navigate. If you're outside of higher ed, colleges can be a little bit intimidating. Do you talk to a career center? Do you talk to a professor? We have 14 colleges in our consortium. So for a small business, it's difficult to know where to go. So they can come to our website, post an internship on our site, which gets listed on our website, but it also gets sent out to our 14 member institutions to post in their career centers. So it's a way for us to broker opportunities. So it helps businesses by giving them a central front door, helps students by giving them more opportunities than they might have known about. But administratively, how does this work? And I was interested in maybe how this works administratively for both of you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say a student is at uh, McDaniel, mm -hmm. which, are, who, which I believe is a member are, of your consortium, uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and that's a long way away from downtown Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So is this, are a lot of students from McDaniel coming in to do internships? Well, they are, yeah. In the Baltimore region, McDaniel is part of the greater Baltimore region, um, but primarily when you're looking at internships are going to be in a central business district. Um, McDaniel's on a very rural campus in Westminster, Maryland, and so there aren't as many opportunities um, in that region as students are going to find in Baltimore. So a lot of them are coming into Baltimore for their internships, but also their social activities. That's generally what binds our colleges together is that they consider Baltimore to be their city, and, and that's true of McDaniel as well. 
Well, fair enough. In terms of in terms of in, in Southern California, how does that work? If it, do you do something like that in terms of helping students get internships? Uh, there, are, each of the schools provides an internship program, and those are eligible to all the students who attend the Claremont colleges. But the Claremont colleges are more bound by history. All of the colleges were born from each other. So having about an 80-year history, Pomona College being the founding college, then was followed by a series of additional colleges. And so there's a, there's a little bit more of a, a formal sisterhood, if you will, between those institutions. And so they share internships. There's cross-registration of all of the classes. Uh, and then they share a lot of the common services. And the cross-registration is all classes? Basically, for the five, we have five undergraduate colleges, Pomona, Scripps, Harvey Mudd, Pitzer, and Claremont McKenna. Those students actually have an integrated registration process. They have borderless access. There's no exchange of fees between the colleges, and so that really encourages cross-registration. And I would say a typical student in their four years would have about a third of their classes that they took at another college. That's a very high number. It's a very high number. Mm -hmm. Is that, and I know you're, on, you're active in the national organization about university consortia, is that a high number relative to your peers around the country? I think if you look at the members of the ACL, the Association for Consortium Leadership, which is a, a professional organization that all of my, Kristen and, and me would belong to, uh, probably that's a higher number than average. But I, I wouldn't really want to hit that note too hard because I think you're going to find that a lot of collaboration is about academic collaboration, not just about sharing of business services. Uh, but in Claremont, because we're immediately adjacent to each other and the five undergraduate colleges of the seven that are members are residential colleges, there's really a lot of incentive and ease of uh, being able to, to share classes. Whereas, for example, the five colleges in Massachusetts have a bit more distance between them, but they also still maintain a high crossover rate when it comes to students who take courses at some point in their four years at one of the other colleges. Well, you raised the issue of the five colleges in Massachusetts. Carol Christ was uh, down here a few segments ago uh, from Smith, uh, and that raises the issue of the women's uh, aspects of uh, the Claremont schools. Scripps right. is a women's school. How does that work with uh, the rest of the schools? I would say that if you talk to the women at Scripps, they would say it's the perfect solution, right? <laughs> they have the ability to, to uh, you know, maintain what is the best parts of a woman's college, which is to you know, really have uh, a focus on the, the issues from a woman's perspective and a little bit less of the competitiveness that sometimes happens where, where women are sidelined. Uh, but also they have a very integrated uh, population on the social side and also on the academic side. A lot of men take co uh, courses over at Scripps. Uh, of course, the women participate in a lot of uh, sporting and social activities on the other campuses. Uh, so there's a real integration there, but they still are able to cloister themselves in their core curriculum and really enjoy the best parts of a woman's college. Fair enough. And in terms of the library, you have a joint library, if I'm not mistaken, as well. We do. The Claremont University Consortium, which is a separate 501c3 corporation, actually owns both the library property and the collections. And then we collaboratively serve all seven institutions, the five undergraduate and two graduate schools. One of the tremendous advantages of this, from a financial perspective, is that given the same amount of dollars that we spend, we get a much broader and richer collection than a, a smaller liberal arts college would be able to afford on its own. If I could use the example, if we were all going to buy one copy of Gone with the Wind, we buy one copy of Gone with the Wind and then six copies of something else. And so it gives us the purchasing power, really the economies of scale of benefiting uh, the collection of the library to really be a research library but we still maintain these sort of small, intimate, uh, liberal arts residential college cultures on the undergraduate side, but we're able to then also support some pretty strong PhD programs uh, for the graduate programs. Well, and in terms of this kind of intimate nature of the liberal arts colleges versus the large one, maybe if I can throw this to both of you, uh, I'm hearing that uh, the consortium is important on, on different levels, but I'm also thinking that, think about a school like the University of Michigan. If somebody was here right now from Michigan, they would say, well, we have a big university, uh, but we have a small liberal arts, uh, we have a small uh, residential component where people can live in a residential college and get the best of both worlds. And I hear you both saying, well, it's kind of the opposite, where, well, we have s smaller places, but we're kind of now grabbing the resources from all those places. How would you compare the consortium that you, that you each run to, let's say, Michigan or Ohio State or a big university that would probably make the opposite argument? 
I know in our consortium, we have 14 colleges and they're all very different from each other. There's one Johns Hopkins University, there's one Notre Dame of Maryland, our women's college, one Jesuit institution, Loyola University, um, two HBCUs. So everybody has a really different profile and we find that especially after the first year that a student has gotten used to their individual campus, they're really interested in what the experience of other campuses might be. Um, and so an academic agreement allows them to take an art class at the Maryland Institute, for instance, an art college. You're not going to get that kind of experience at a large public institution. Um, take language classes or a music class at Peabody. Um, so I think that students you know, choose their institution for a reason. Um, and once they kind of get to know the boundaries of that institution, are very interested in what the experience of other students in their city might be. Or at least that, that's what we found. And how many students in Baltimore actually do take advantage of taking courses at other it's campuses? It's fewer than. Um, um, a traditional academic consortium might be um, primarily because of geographic distance but also scheduling differences so every campus is on different kinds of schedules and so that makes it somewhat difficult for students to find a way to get to class and then actually take a class but um, we know several hundred students a semester are cross-listed between our institutions and um, that's why we started a shuttle system actually between those colleges to help facilitate um, that academic agreement and we primarily find that students are cross-listed for art, music, language classes that might be fairly specialized. Um, they can also use the libraries at any of our institutions and so they'll use especially use that for special collections or things that might be unique to a particular library on a particular campus. Is there a consortium ID card? No, you just have your regular university ID and that's accepted at any of the libraries. And in Claremont, is there a, what, what kind of student ID card is a student carrying? Well, one of the services that we provide centrally is a centralized ID card. Mm -hmm. Now, each college brands it and imp imprints it so that it looks like the student belongs to that institution, but uh, they're all coordinated centrally. So it's almost kind of like you're running one of those Visa cards or MasterCards exactly. where it says something on it, but it's really a Visa card or a MasterCard? Exactly, exactly. But back to your question about the University of Michigan comparison to Claremont, I, I agree with uh, what Kristen said about some of the, of the differences. And I would say in our case, uh, to hit the, the notes a little bit differently, uh, you know, the, the reason that students come to the Claremont College is on the graduate level, I haven't really talked about them yet, is we have two graduate programs, Claremont Graduate University, which is a comprehensive graduate university, and then the Keck Graduate Institute, which is focused on the biomedical sciences. Uh, but if we look at the collaboration of the five undergraduate schools, uh, I'd say the big difference is comparing them to, say, an honors college, which you would sometimes see within a major university, mm -hmm. a state university, is that, one, all of our colleges are really focused on teacher scholars uh, at an undergraduate level, and we don't use teaching assistants. So you have basically tenure or tenure track faculty, for the most part, teaching classes, much smaller class size. That's a little different than an honors college where they continue to have a research role as a big part of their faculty commitment. Secondly, these are all residential colleges. It's really not an option to live off campus. And so for the full four years, we really view it as a 24-hour living learning environment. Uh, and this tends to have a very different impact on the student experience. And I think that that's one of the big differences. So even though we're a collection of 5,000 undergraduates collectively, each student still really focuses on their local school and there's a lot of the culture that they take away as an alumni. Uh, when you talk to students about where they went to school and they're talking to another Claremont College person, they would say, well, I went to Harvey Mudd or I went to Pomona or Scripps. When they leave the cloister and they're in the city or somewhere else, they tend to refer to themselves as I went to one of the Claremont Colleges. So it's an interesting uh, self-branding that they've created. Well, that does raise an interesting question, which is that, you know, some of your schools are quite different from one another. Uh, and I know certainly in Baltimore that's the case, but even in the Claremont schools, uh, Pitzer and uh, Claremont McKenna uh, feel very different when you're on their campuses. And we celebrate that. Actually, I think one of the great things that I've been able to observe about the Claremont colleges is the huge diversity and what actually that brings to the academic program. So you have different students who tend to align to different uh, emphasis and cultures that the colleges have, but those mixtures within the academic er arena and the social arena as well, uh, or co-curricular areas are really very helpful. Uh, and I'll, I'll say one other thing that perhaps people don't realize, and that is that our colleges have a large amount of what we in the profession call cross-application. How do, you know, they compete with each other for the same students. We actually find that that makes our schools stronger by having the fact that they're actually competing with each other, they set a much higher bar than if they were a standalone college in, in, a, in a city.
what, what would you say are some of the difficulties? Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you guys run these, uh, these consortia, and this is exciting, and this is what you do all day, but what are some of the challenges that you face uh, as you start your day every day? <laughs> um, you know, sometimes for us, we run into problems. We have both private institutions and state institutions in our consortium, and they have different kinds of charters, different kinds of missions, large schools versus small in most cases, um, and sometimes we run into some problems with that. By and large, the schools are very interested in working with each other, which is one of the great parts about my job, um, is that the schools really believe in collaboration. But for instance, running a shuttle bus when people have to agree on liability waivers that are governed by the state or governed by a private institution, it gets a little messy figuring out some of those nitty gritty details. The intent is good, but sometimes working through some of the details between public and private institutions is difficult. But let's talk about liability for a second. <laughs> uh, you know, that's an interesting point, which is what happens if I ride the bus from one school to another and something happens on the bus? Who, who's responsible for that? Well, we've talked about that at length, and luckily we've never had an incident. Um, but we carry private insurance. Um, the contractor that we use for our buses also carries insurance, and each inv individual institution covers their students as well. So it's covered on a number of different levels. Did you want to get back, Bob, to the issue of what would be a challenging thing? Because I know you're on this national board, so right. certainly if you right. don't have those issues, right. I suspect some of your colleagues do. I think that everyone finds there are challenges with collaboration. Collaboration, in my view, is not entirely a natural act. It is a practice, <laughs> uh, it is a practice technique. And the more you practice it, the better you get at it. I would say the common themes, if I were to look at themes more than incidents about Claremont, would be communication is always an issue, even within a single institution. Sometimes effectively communicating can be challenging. When you move to multiple institutions that are both competing and also cooperating, uh, you know, it, it, you have to take the high road. It's the one less traveled, and sometimes that's difficult. Uh, there are some very basic coordination points. I think Kristen raised a very simple but good one, and that is simply aligning the times of classes can be a barrier or an enabler to a good collaborative academic program. But then there are other issues. You know, you, you have institutional administrators who are competing for the same grants from the same grant agencies. You have, uh, you know, you're competing for board members even in a private college mm -hmm. setting, you know, who all come from essentially the same kind of community. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are the natural tensions. I actually view them as creative tensions. Actually, a lot of creative you know, results can come from these kinds of tensions. But I think that if you continue to work at it, the, we view it as sort of a net plus one. You know, even though there are times it's frustrating to have to get buy-in from other institutions to do something that would be simply very simple if you were on your own, the, the significant advantages outweigh them so much that it's really, it's hard not on balance to focus on that. And one example would be, for liberal arts colleges to be able to offer a full program in Arabic language, for example, would be quite difficult, mm -hmm. no matter how wealthy you are, and yet we're able to do that because we make that work as a group, not as a single institution. You know, another thing that we're working through it right now that I imagine is happening nationally is brokering relationships with community colleges. So we know that a tremendous number of students are going to community colleges for financial reasons or otherwise career placement. And so how do you take that group of students and make them feel integrated into the college experience that we're trying to offer, you know, between our institutions? That might be transferring, that might be, you know, can they participate in an academic agreement? Um, how do you connect them to the greater college experience? And I think that's something that, again, that, I think that conversation is happening nationally as more students travel that path, um, two years at a community college, switching to a four-year, and how do you make them feel like that experience? Um, is a full college experience. And if I could jump in and add one more, I mean, I'm just a very practical lover. Our, our students love the fact that they can eat in a different dining hall every day. <laughs> because again, if you have true collaboration, you have much more choice than you would at a single institution. Well, it sounds like you both are describing marriage. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing, where there's a communication component, there's a sharing component, and there's an autonomy component, and there's a oneness component altogether. Actually, I often refer to my job as marriage because we're trying to attract students and then engage them, and then we try to retain them because we want them to stay, so it's very much like marriage. <laughs> well, we've been married for 80 years and not been divorced yet, so I guess it's worth it. <laughs> Fair enough. In terms of uh, professors, do professors ever complain that they have to write too many letters of recommendation or there are too many students who are now coming into their classes? Do you ever hear any complaints about that? I, I really don't. In fact, I've heard just the opposite. One of the... Uh, one of the sort of hidden truths of collaboration in higher ed is that some, you know, do you, do you do a balance sheet sort of, you know, 
collaborative effort by collaborative effort, or do you look at the blended result? We tend to look at the blended result because sometimes there are periods of altruism where one institution is sort of overlooking the inconvenient facts uh, of a particular single effort. So an example would be I heard a provost from one of our schools talking about even though they tend to take in more students than they send to some of the other schools, they are very much the beneficiary of having really bright students from very different types of experiences come into their classes, particularly at the upper class level, and be able to have a class make with eight or ten students in a very advanced subject rather than having a barely make class of four or five. So I think that, that actually uh, the faculty that I hear talk about this really celebrate the collaboration both on the student level in terms of their access to good students, but also the mathematicians love to get together with the mathematicians, you know, the, you know, the historians like to get together, and so I think that there's also a faculty culture that can exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found that too. The faculty really like a conference that we do every year based on service learning where faculty members present best practices or examples of how they've brought service learning projects into their classrooms. And um, we found that professors from you know, all kinds of different colleges enjoy learning from each other, enjoy those forums where they can talk to each other about best practices. Um, because even you know, in a city, there's sometimes you don't even know what's going on next door to you, let alone you know, across town. Um, and so I think that on the academic side, they do appreciate the opportunity to, to learn from their peers. Well, how about international students? Do international students have difficulty navigating, or do you just treat the international students just like the American students? I think we, you know, we essentially have to, you know, uh, bring them into our culture a little differently in terms of making sure that they have the proper skill sets. We have very, very good international students. About uh, six to seven, maybe eight percent of our student population are international students. I think once they're there, we do have some special programming to, again, try and, you know, accommodate their needs, but really no differently than we do for Chicano Latino students or students of color or students of certain religions as, as we try and, and, you know, make sure that they have a positive experience. Uh, I would say that we, uh, you know, recruit internationally and we see that as an important part of the culture because I think all of our students really want more of a global perspective mm -hmm. when they look at their educational outlook. So I think that it probably would not differ that much because we're a collaboration than it would if we were a single institution. Mm -hmm. We find international students often embrace different kinds of programs that are offered. I mean, they're really interested. They know they're coming into a new, new culture, and so they're interested in learning a lot about it. Um, so we find they come to programs. They're easy to get sort of out of their shell and bubble because, you know, everything's new, so they just want to sort of take everything in at once. Um, so, I mean, I think that, as Bob said, I mean, it's a great um, addition to this overall population of students to have this very global mix. If I can ask you about how you fund your the central offices. Do you kind of send a bill every year to the institutions, or how does that work? Okay. Um, we do. So every college in our membership pays uh, base dues, um, and then some colleges pay more than others, depending on the different programs that they're in. So our shuttle is more expensive. We run a um, service learning cohort group that colleges pay extra for, and then we get some funding from local jurisdictions and foundations in Baltimore. What's the, if you don't mind me asking, what's the basic Amount. It's 22000 and that is regardless of size, so the smallest schools and the largest schools, everybody pays the same. So we have a, a, a long history together, and because of that, ours has uh, become maybe like the tax code. You know, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> uh, we, we use a number of different funding me methods in Claremont. Uh, so one is we use formulas, and we try and develop formulas for each of the major services that tend to scale. So for example, we happen to operate the employee benefit programs on behalf of all the colleges. So that tends to be based on FTE, mm -hmm. and they pay a certain amount. Whereas when we <clears throat> support our health programs for students, that tends to be based on student FTE. So we do have about 30 different formulas in Claremont that cover these. We've never met a complicated formula we didn't love in Claremont. <clears throat> but that said, we also provide fee-for-service. So there are some things in the facilities management area uh, and some of the other programs where it really is opt-in uh, by the colleges and they buy those services because they think they offer a good value. And we're also fortunate enough to have an actual endowment for the consortium itself. So in addition to the individual colleges having an endowment, we've been able to find that there are funders uh, and foundations who really value the idea of collaboration and ha have helped us build some endowment that underwrites some programs. But you have a $38 million budget if I 
That's correct. That's just for the consortial aspects, yes. That's a very high number for a, consor you know, for a collaborating body, isn't it? It is, but if, I think that it, it reflects the fact that we actually manage a lot of direct services and are really not, these are not what I would call options or uh, frills, if you will. Uh, so a good example that we haven't mentioned yet would be that we operate a campus safety and security force that's shared by all the colleges. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot more depth and ability of that force to be able to accommodate the varying needs of a college than if they tried to do it as a one-off on their own. Uh, and an example would be there are some times when there's only one or two officers needed to patrol a particular campus. But then when they're having a particular special event, like we had Condoleezza Rice come and speak at a, a symposium at Claremont McKenna College, we were able to mobilize about 30 or 40 officers to come and participate in that to provide security and crowd control. So I think that, that you know, it, it is a large budget, but I think that if you look, that's because we're providing a lot more services in comparison to a lot of other consortia which tend to have more of a project focus or they're supporting collaboration where there's direct relationships between the colleges. Thank you, I think you've both made an interesting case for, you know, for consortia and uh, hopefully some of our viewers and people who see this afterwards will find this interesting and, and spend some time looking at both of uh, your uh, organizations and what you provide. So thank you both for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting thank you, Steve. us. If you would like additional information about the Claremont University Consortium, or the Baltimore College Town Network, please visit cuc.claremont.edu or baltimorecollegetown.org. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.